Okay, so thanks for coming and thanks for the people online also for joining. Uh, so as uh, Danny was saying, I work for Observatoire des Multinationales. It's a French um, lobby watchdog, we would say. I used to work for Corporate Europe Observatory, which is a European lobby watchdog. And at the moment, what I do mostly is I look at the corporations and how they try to influence the French presidency of the Council of the EU. So this is going to be very EU centered and I know some of you are not very familiar with EU politics. So there's just there's three main institutions in um, the European Union. One of them is the council and every six months you have a country that leads the council. It means that it really coordinates all the files that go through the councils, but it also has the power to initiate or at least push for certain issues that are more dear to that country. So France, for instance, is now the president of the council. France loves nuclear energy, so nuclear energy is back on the agenda because France is on at the council. So over France, most of the time, coordinates things that are already on the table. It does also have a substantial leverage to uh, bring new issues on the table, such as nuclear. So that's why. I, so although I work for French NGO, I'm actually based in Brussels and I've been for the past seven years. So I'm going to give you a critical look about how corporations tend to influence EU politics. So there's first a disclaimer. I don't have anything against big business. I just have a problem with the fact that they take all the democratic space sometimes in EU discussions. And I have, any, and I have my own views about the European Union, but I'm not telling you this because I'm against the European Union. I think it would be very much better for the European Union if we could actually have critical discussions about how it works. Um, so I'm just going to give you really an, a big picture idea about how corporations uh, try to influence um, European policies. And the examples I'm going to give you is about the French presidency because this is what's happening now. But if you have questions later on, I can answer for other topics if you wish, if I can also. Um, so that's who we are, who I am. And... Um, Maybe uh, first thing, what is lobbying? So when you try to lobby, you try to influence legislation. So you try to make sure that the laws go towards your interests. And as Danny was saying, in a way, I'm also a lobbyist. So it's not only because you work for a corporation that you're a lobbyist. You have public authorities that do lobbying in Brussels. Sometimes it's for policies, but sometimes it's also for money. So Catalonia, for instance, has a really big office next to the institutions. It's for political reasons, obviously, but also to get some funds from the European Union. And you have what we would call advocacy organization or public interest organization, consumer groups, trade unions or NGOs. So that's the three different types of lobbies that you can find in Brussels. I would love to tell you how many lobbyists there are, but I can't. If I was in Washington and I was explaining you about US politics, I would be able to tell you there's that many lobbyists registered in Washington. It's not the case in Brussels. So tomorrow I can open my own public uh, firm, call it Laura Corporation, whatever, and come in the parliament, talk to a member of the European Parliament, and he or she would know who I work for, which wouldn't be the case if I was doing this in Congress. So those figures that I show you here are estimates. They basically, they are divided up in three uh, numbers because I think it's important that you get the idea that some people, about six, seven thousand, do lobbying on a full-time basis. From Monday morning to Friday evening, they're just lobbyists. But we estimate that there's about 30 to 40,000 people that actually do some lobbying. So for instance, you can be a scientist for Bayer, a chemical company, and sometimes you'll come to Brussels and talk to a politician or you trade in London for a big, uh, big bank and sometimes we'll come to Brussels and meet politicians because they're actually going to be an, uh, a law about something that you're really an expert on. So not all lobbyists do this on a full-time basis, but there's a lot of them doing lobbying in, in the European capital. Yeah, we tend all, always to say Brussels, but yeah, it's the European capital, not just Brussels. Um, there's a lot of things that are really peculiar to the lobbying uh, at the European Union level. First, there's a whole thing about the history of the European Union. So what you have to think, back in the days when it was all created, you only had six nations that created a high authority that became the Commission. And it was a brand new authority. They had few officials. And basically those officials needed power, no? They needed to regulate. They were going to regulate the European market, but they didn't get much information from their colleagues. So imagine you are 
regulating the olive market in Brussels and you want to call the French authorities and you want to know if they, what kind of olives should we sell, what kind of olive we should import, or things like this, they wouldn't always get the information because the civil servant in Paris would say, why would I tell him this or tell her this? Because she's just gonna regulate and take away my job, right? So there was this competition where it was difficult for officials at the beginning in the commission to get information from the capitals. So what they did is that in some sectors they actually pushed for the creation of a lobby organization. So they went to the olive producers and say, guys, get together, do a European group of olive producers and help us and tell us what you need, what we can do for you, how we open the market, how we regulate and things like this. This has been the result of a research by Sylvain Laurent, who's been looking into all the archives of the commission, but he's also been um, interviewing a lot of lobbyists. And he found that that was very, from the beginning, there was a really clear relation between the lobbies and the commission. And it was a win-win uh, relationship. The commission was gaining information, so authority, power, and the business groups were getting access to politicians. So both, on both sides, they were happy. The reasons also why I want to tell you this is from the beginning, I want to stress the fact that I might be showing you how the bad corporations are doing bad lobbying, but it's a, lobbying is also a relationship, no? Those corporations have also so much power in Brussels because in front of them, they have institutions that are willing to hear and willing to help, right? So we, it's really about a relationship. It's not just about the corporations. Well, you know the, the current ideology in, in the institutions is very neoliberal. It's this idea that what's good for corporations is going to be good for the European citizens. So that also explains why corporations have so much power. But also something that you can see is, is the structure of the European Union. So for instance, the European Union will be criticized for being really slow in making legislation. So the institutions have an incentive to actually try to side with big business to make sure that there will be no blockage and that things get done quicker, right? That's because of the way the European Union works. Also, and this is going to be a recurring theme all along the presentation, you don't really have a genuine European counterpower, right? You don't have a European social movement. The Europeans don't listen to the same radio show every morning. There's not a European newspaper that's translated in all the European languages. Most people in Europe don't know who a commissioner is. So you don't really have a counterpower, like a European demos, if you want, which also explains why if corporations can have so much influence. Um, I just want to give you here, for instance, an example of an expert group. Um, so those groups are groups that are made by the Commission to get advice on a specific policy. So in this case, it's on gas. And here, so it, you see um, they're working on gas at the European level, and so those are people that advise the Commission before the legislation is being drafted. And if you see at the kind of people we're talking about, it's only and mostly trade and business associations. He, on gas, a fossil fuel, you have no environmental organization. But also gas means pipelines. Pipelines means, you know, displacement, means communities are going to be put aside for pipelines. No one is there neither. And here again, if you show this to somebody from the Commission, most of the time the argument I get is that they need to know how the gas companies feel about legislation so that it doesn't get blocked later on. So it also again goes back to this idea of the what I was telling you about the structure. They, most of the time civil servants will say we're under pressure to actually make legislation faster. So how does it work? Um, I did say that you don't have to register to uh, uh, actually um, meet uh, uh, politicians in the European Union. There, is, there are some exceptions. If you want to meet a commissioner or if you want to meet a member of the cabinet, you have to register now. So that's an improvement. Um, if I was telling you who do you think are the biggest corporation lobbying in Brussels, who, what, who do you think are the biggest lobbyists? Pharmaceutical, they're quite big at the moment, yeah. <laughs> but they're not the biggest one. Agriculture, Agriculture yeah. Car makers. Car makers. Car makers, yeah, they're pretty big also. But if you look here, so this is a Transparency International, is an NGO 
what you have here is official data from the European institutions, but they've just gathered it in a different way. So it's like official data from the commissions, right? Here they put down the lobbyists according to the register. So it's obviously not the full picture, but actually if you look at the number of meetings, for instance here you have the number of meetings with commissioners, you have Google, Airbus, but what's also interesting is when you see the number of lobbyists they have. Here you probably have um, people that you know less about. Um, CIFIC is one of the biggest ones. CIFIC is the European Chemicals uh, Association. It's all the chemicals company that sell in Europe. So here you also have Dole Chemicals, you also have Chinese companies. It's not because it's a European Chemical Trade Association that you only have European companies, right? It's all the companies that sell in Europe. That one is the biggest one. But I actually want to, this one, accreditation is probably going to be the one that's most reliable. Okay, so that's most reliable because this comes from the Parliament. Accreditation means it's the number of passes they have to go inside the European Parliament. And this is, comes directly from the European Parliament website. So here we know that it's reliable. It's not the company self-registering. It's the Parliament telling us this. And what you have here is you have companies that you've probably never heard of, such as Ruth Peterson Public Affairs, or Human Brophy, or Afford or whatever. So for instance, when you told me about the pharmaceuticals, pharmaceuticals are working a lot with Human Brophy. The car company are working with Crab. You don't have them here. They might come later on. But what I want to show you here is that actually the biggest lobbyists are not the corporations. You would think, you know, that the BMW has a float of, I see it, a float of like 25 lobbyists, but that's not the case. BMW spends a lot of money on public relations companies that do the lobbying for them. I call them lobby mercenaries. It's people that you pay to make lobbying for you. And they are the one really having a lot of influence. Um, if we try to look by lobby expense, you get also, so you see you've got, yeah, for instance, FTI works with all the banks. Fleshman locks a lot for BASF and Bayer for the chemicals. And ETRL locks a lot for the agri business that you were mentioning. And Bursical and Waffles, I wish I knew, but I don't know who they work for. You had a question? Someone had a question there. No? Okay. If you have a question, tell me. Yeah? Okay, so what really works is, in terms of lobbying, is when you're discreet. So, for instance, there's a law firm, Sidley Hostin, that comes from the, the US. If you look at their website, they say they help companies, industry associations, governments navigate and shape EU rules. To me, they're doing lobbying, right? But they're not on the transparency register. The really important thing you have to think of is it's what I call the bubble effect. What you try to do, for instance, when you Google, is you try to convince decision makers, but not only by sending Google lobbyists to members of the European Parliament. What you try to do is try to make sure that the Google, Google message is the only message that you hear around in the bubble. So how do you do this? Google will fund think tanks. They will provide money to communication agency public relations agency, they will fund other associations or they will fund the journalists, uh, sorry, journals, uh, newspapers like Politico or Euractiv. So what happens if Google, for instance, doesn't want to get taxed because it, they, Google will probably say it's going to have an impact on consumers if Google get taxed. Well, the thing is, a think tank might actually do a study saying, ah, if you tax Google, it's going to cost this amount of money to consumers. Then you're probably going to have an event on this in, and then you have a communication agency they're going to sell this story to journalists and then you probably have an event in the parliament and you probably meet someone from the commission. So at the end, when you're a decision maker, someone tells you, comes to your office and say, you shouldn't tax Google. You read in the newspaper that you shouldn't tax Google. You get a study that says this is actually going to have a price for European consumers. And at the end of the day, you think, wow, everybody tells me I shouldn't, so why should I tax Google? The problem is it's not everybody. It's the same company that has made sure that it's the same message that comes to you across different channels. And that's really how it works. And that's also why it's questionable in terms of democracy, because if there's so much of this public discourse spaces that's captured by companies, 
how do you make sure you have a real debate and you have opposing uh, views? Obviously, it's called revolving doors in English. You probably have heard of it. It's one of the best ways of lobbying is to recruit former officials. It's the perfect way of getting access, right? And there's a lot of uh, examples. You have uh, commissioners. Uh, that so commissioners that are a bit like ministers. They're, there's a word commissioner per country in the European Union, and they head the commission where the laws are being drafted. Former commissioners have, some of them have created their own lobbying firms. So Hottinger was the German commissioner for budget, the last commission. He created his lobbying firm while still in office, two months before the end of his mandate, he created his own lobbying firm. A trade commissioner last year had to resign because he was found playing golf and having a party during lockdown in Ireland. He's created his own lobbying firm and his lobbying firm is being contracted by a big law firm now called DLA Pepper. So he's actually avoiding the rules because there should be six months before he joins a lobby uh, job. But what he does is he's done a lobbying firm and the lobbying firm is contracted by the law firm. So he's not directly employed, so he can do it. And that's one also of the problem with Brussels is that most of the time the rules are too weak. And if you don't respect them, there are no sanctions. So there's really, they're not scared basically of being trapped by if they don't respect the rules. So OVO is really, so here you have an example where it's the former ambassador of France called Pierre Celal. He was the, what we call uh, represent permanent representative, so the voice of France in the European Council. Um, he was there between 2002 and 2009, 2014 and 2017. He's now on the board of Areva, the nuclear French company in EDF. And he's also now working for Auguste de Boussy, a law firm, and we don't know who their clients are. But he's been referred to in the National Assembly in France as the most knowledgeable man in France on the details of European reality. So that means if you are Auguste de Bouzy, you're recruiting someone that's the most knowledgeable about how it works in the council. And the council is full of diplomats and there's very, very little transparency rules. So you get really, really good intelligence. You probably, yeah, you get a really good knowledge that most other law firms wouldn't. And for your clients, it's perfect. You can sell the fact that you, ha you get the direct access to the council. But it's not only about politics. It's also about expertise. And this is really something um, to be reminded that um, I'm really not saying that the, the corporations are silly because a lot of the time they come with technical experts. And the problem is that a lot of the time they fill in a lack of expertise that the institutions don't have. And that's really a real issue about democracy because the fact is that EU legislation is complicated, it's technical, it's in English, it takes time. And not everybody has this time and this expertise, which also explains why then the debate is so limited between experts. And this expertise sometimes is only, uh, uh, the corporations are the only ones who, ha who have them. For instance, on pharmaceutical, on chemicals, on finance. I've seen members of the European Parliament that have told me I need to ask lobbies how it works, I don't understand otherwise. And there's also things like, uh, I know people who work for an a financial NGO called uh, Finance Watch and they work at the European level, but those are former bankers that used to earn so much money that it's very difficult for the NGO to then recruit former bankers to be able to understand EU legislation from a public interest perspective, you know? So it's not only experts, it's also people that are really expensive to hire, which also again limits the amount of dissenting views that you can have and limits the debate. Really one of the things also that you need to know when you're a lobbyist is the earlier the better. It's really when you start lobbying at the beginning that you really make a difference. Let me give you an example. Um, not long ago there was a herbicide called glyphosate that really made it into the news because uh, it's really controversial. The World Health Organization thing is probably carcinogenic. So Europe had to renew the glyphosate and obviously after the World Health Organization verdict it was a bit complicated. Imagine uh, if you are a chemical company, what you're going to try to do is come at the beginning to try to influence the discussion on um, how long do we renew it, right? Do we renew it for 10 years or 15 years? That's what you're going to try to do. You're not going to be questioning renewal. We renew just how long, right? Greenpeace on the other side will come and say, we don't renew, you know, this is too dangerous, we just ban it. If the chemicals company gets this way first, when the discussions become public, it's only about how long do we renew 
And if you're Greenpeace, you come here and you think, oh, we shouldn't, we shouldn't. You're too late. The debate has started and you're not relevant anymore. There's another, another example maybe that makes it clear is with carbon tax or carbon markets. I don't know if any of you did environmental economics. Uh, yeah, they do a lot of that. Uh, you do a lot of that, okay. So you know the difference between the trading system and the tax, right? And there's a whole debate in the academia. Well, actually, when this, the carbon market was being renewed in Europe, there was never that debate about taxing. The debate has always been how do we renew the carbon markets, although they were not really effective. Never ever have we had a discussion, why don't we change and then put a tax? And this is one of the examples of how cooperation influence debate. They were here first and they framed the discussion into how do we renew? And they closed the debate and they was never able again to say, should we renew or not? And I used to work at that time for an NGO that was actually campaigning against renewal and for tax, and we were irrelevant. If you meet somebody from the institutions, you're like, no, but we need a tax. You're not helping them because they have a legislative file that's complicated. They need someone to help them on how best we renew. And if you come and you say, we don't renew, we do something else, we're too late. So it really also has an impact. The earlier is really the better. Okay, I realize that I've been speaking a lot, so I'm going to try to go a bit faster and give space for the discussions. So just want to try to illustrate this bubble effect that I was telling you, right? Or whole different, different actors try to influence decision makers. Um, ah. Sorry. So if you're Philip Morris, for instance, you will have your offices as Philip Morris, but you will also be probably be a member of Business Europe, which is the, the association of all uh, European big business. And you also have the European Smoking and Tobacco Association. So you have, you know, your company has your lobbyists, you have your trade association. And as I was saying, some trade associations were created by the commission. Uh, here's an example from the French presidency. That's French presidency of the EU, sorry. Uh, Macron created Scallop Europe, which is like a European uh, confederation of uh, basically tech startups. And he actually uh, made a meeting in the Elysee between Scallop Europe and European digital ministers. Um, but again, this is what I'm saying. It's, you have to think also, it's, this is a really good example how it's not just the, how the tech company is strong, it's also how politicians give them a lot of power. Because in this case, Macron was inviting them in, in the Elysee. So lawyers are also quite a powerful voice. Here you have Jean de Rutte that used to work for the Belgian government. Uh, it was a Belgian diplomat and he now works for Covington and Berlin, a law firm. And he says, I know exactly how to get what I want from this system. As I was saying, Phil Hogan, former trade commissioner, now works for DLI Piper. And here you have a really interesting um, example of a law firm and what they offer in Brussels. I find it really interesting because it shows you um, the spin, basically. So this is their website, and this they obviously showcase what they do because they have to sell the services. Um, and here they mention um, the, the Greek crisis and the Greek bank. So there was a Greek bank that was supposedly going to get audited by the European Central Bank. Basically, the European Central Bank felt, OK, before we send them so much money, we might actually check if they're OK receiving this money and if there's nothing dodgy there. Obviously, the Greek bank didn't want to get audited. So they called Abba and Geiger and said, well, guys, do something. We don't want to get audited. We want the money, but we don't want the audit. <laughs> and here they explain you how in six months they managed to change the discourse and uh, the ECB forgot about the audit. And their argument was, when they went to the ECB, they say, guys, if you audit that Greek bank, you're going to tell the markets and show the markets that the Greek bank is weak. And if you show the market that the Greek bank is weak, it's going to get things even worse than they are at the moment. So you risk another financial crisis if you do that audit. They're not, I'm not saying they're wrong. What I'm saying is the spin. You know, you know the spin, the, the game, right? It's exactly it's peanuts. They show another, another face, another argument. They show it differently. And they won after six months. At the end, they're really proud here of saying, that they helped prevent another wave of economic instability in Greece. <laughs> but they're not saying, again, it's their way of showing the problem. I would have another perspective. Um, here you have public relations. So 
that's the, what I call the lobby, the lobby mercenaries. That's the people that you buy to do lobbying for you, right? Um, so first thing that I think is a bit problematic. APCO is the biggest communicate, one of the biggest communications and public relations agency in the world, and it has worked for government. So when Croatia was president of the Council of the EU, its communications were made by APCO. And that really, for me, raises a problem. It means that APCO, APCO has private clients. APCO, for instance, works for Digital Europe, for Google, for instance, Google, Facebook. Um, it's, so it has a lot of private clients. And at the same time, it works for the president of the council. So people in APCO have access to the council that they can also sell to their private clients, right? And they do this really well. Here is another uh, case study that they show on their website. They've been, uh, they used to show on their website. <laughs> Um, I've got it printed. Hey, they don't do this to me, I get them printed. I can show it around. Um, they worked for Digital Europe, APCO, and they made sure that the council was going to change their mind in two weeks. So they explain it to you here, how they did it. So. They were working for Digital Europe, so that's all the digital companies, the GAFAM mostly. Uh, they needed to change the opinion of the council in two weeks about the copyright levy on the internet. And they did it by influencing politicians, but also by getting a lot of social media campaign, good articles in the Financial Times, and a lot of Twitter campaign, and then they managed to change the opinion of the council. Is it COVID-wise, is it okay if we share? Yes, because people are meant to use uh, Okay. Uh, um, well, you'll see over there, um, here for instance, you see Dominique Christori, he used to be the Director General of Energy. So that's the person below the Commissioner for Energy. The Commissioner for Energy would tend to be the person that's public, that goes to the events, to the speeches, everything. And the Director General is actually the person that does all the details and that really the, the person that really works all day long and they don't have to talk to the press or anyone else. Uh, he had been there for a long time in the Commission as a DG Energy. And he joined uh, Danton Global Advisors Interrail, which is a public relations as a senior advisor. And one of the clients of Interrail is BP. So as a DG, basically, the rules would ask him to take six months before he goes to BP. But what he did is he went directly to a lobby firm that works for BP. Sorry, I, I know at the end of this lecture, some of you are going to get really depressed. But I'm going to try and end up with a nice note, <laughs> if I can. <laughs> um, that's another one, BCW, you saw it before, person called Waffle. It was in the list of the 10 top lobbyists in terms of uh, accreditation um, and here what you see they've just uh, hired somebody um, uh, Dan Sobovic probably pronounce him badly sorry and Dan Sobovic is not anyone he used to be the speech writer of Sefcovic and Sefcovic is the uh, deputy vice president uh, the vice president of the commission so the speech writer of the vice president of the commission now works for this public relation firm so he will know exactly how to frame things so that means he will know, he will tell his clients of BCW, ah, if you want your message to be heard by Sefcovic, that's what you need to stress. That's how you need to say it. And that's a very valuable thing to have. And they do also other things, public relations. So for instance, Fleshman Hillard did a blacklist of people that were against glyphosate for Monsanto. And glyphosate has now, uh, Monsanto has been bought by uh, Bayer. And um, by your BSF, I get always confused. Oh. Anyway, <laughs> and so that blacklisting involved all the journalists, all the academics, all the activists that were against Monsanto. And this was something that Blair Fleshman Hiller did for Monsanto. And they had the email, the personal number, the address, and lots of details about the, the ways they were working. So that's also what they do. Fleshman Hiller does something else that they're really proud of it, that they call corporate activism. So they would create stunt. Uh, for instance, so I registered to the um, uh, young leaders training, and in the training I was told that um, they paid people to do a stunt in front of the parliament, and the stunt was, we are patient, we need a cure for our, our, our illness, 
And they were in front of the parliament dressed up with big blankets saying, yeah, oh, we need treatment, we need treatment. But behind there, there was a pharmaceutical company that wanted public money for their research on their medicine. And that's what they call corporate activism. And they were paying the people that were saying, we need medicine 10 euros per hour. So they were paid people to pretend they were activists. That's the kind of thing that they do. They're really proud of this because they're one of the first ones to do it in Brussels. Um, this is one of the things that still makes me quite scandalized, but uh, I think if, what have I done? Uh, Ah, okay, this one I also get it printed, so that's fine. Here you have an event. So you have event firms, and what the event firms do, they sell events. And events are important not because you're speaking... The events are not important not beca because you're speaking next to Ursula von der Leyen in this case. The events are important because you speak to Ursula von der Leyen before and after in a very informal way, right? This is really what events are about. Here you have an event, so the, it's done by Forum Europe, and Digital Europe, and uh, here you have really important speakers. You have the president of the commission. She is the person in charge of digital. You have another commissioner. Um, and you have, yeah, if you see the speakers, this I can also pass it around. It's quite impressive, the important people that you have. You also have people from the US government. And what you discover when you actually look at their website is that those people actually paid. So if you're a company, I mean, not them, but the company, for instance, Digital Europe or the other companies that, that are going to be speaking, you have quite a lot of companies after that. You've got Nokia, Atos, Dassault. She, she, that's, she works for the French government. She used to work for the French digital lobby. That's a really good case of a um, revolving door. Um, for 50,000 euro as a company, you get to speak with those people there. So they paid. That's the, that's so paid. Atos paid 50,000. And that's the benefits that you can have. This is from their website. But there's even more. There's only to speak there. But if you want to be in the pre-conference dinner sponsor, that's more expensive. And the price is not there because you need to discuss with them. And that's where, for me, the problem is, is that the day before, the two most important commissioners on digital, and they are, Vestager is powerful. Ursula von der Leyen and Vestager were having dinner with the sponsors of this event who paid to be able to have dinner with them. Yeah. What she should do, but she doesn't have to, Ursula von der Leyen and Margaret Vestager in this case should be writing it in their register of, of meetings. Um, they would probably not, because they would say it's not a meeting, it's an event. An event, they don't have to, but external stakeholders' meetings, they have to. So here they will probably be playing with the rules. The register. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, that's how the amount that they are um, say that the company says they spend on lobbying. Let me check if I did it, if I understood it right. Sorry, it's not my computer, so I'm a bit slower. Um, so you meant when I showed you? Ah, no, it's not this one. It's <laughs> uh, EU. Ah, so this one. Okay. So you mean here the lobby expenses, right? I get you right. Okay. Those are the amounts that companies say they s uh, spend on lobbying. But of the problem is, 
this column, it's meetings with commissioners and heads and cabinet, so the people around the commissioners. And this is information provided by the commission. But it doesn't show you all the meetings, just the top ones. Those are the parliament telling you how many passes they have to enter in and out of the parliament. This is the companies telling you how many lobbyists they have and how much they spend on lobbying. And this is not always reliable. Because, well, sometimes they make mistakes. In this case, I think Flanders make, made a mistake. They don't spend nine million on lobbying. And also sometimes they end the report. So I'm not really good with figures, but let me show you a, uh, an example of under-reporting. Here, ah. Here you have, for instance, uh, an example with uh, Fleshman, Hillard and Monsanto. So you know I told you how Fleshman, Hillard was filing um, uh, opponents of glyphosate. And they, there was a case in court and they lost, and they had to uh, show all the papers. So this is contracts that have been publicly available by now. And here you see, uh, so the contract was 14.5 million euro between October 2016 and December 2017. But what both companies registered is below. So Fleshman Hillard registered only 800,000 in 2016, and Monsanto re registered 600,000 in 2017. So they under-registered what they actually spent on the being. So that's why I was telling you that the figures are not always reliable. Yeah, she doesn't take money. Okay, so, so that's, 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 that's what I don't understand. Because in, a, in some countries, the way that this mechanism would work would be like, uh, she attends the event out of good faith with her friends, who then in good faith support her election campaign. You know what I mean? And yeah. Donations. Is that the same way it works? Like, what is the mechanism? What is incentivizing her to pitch up to a dinner with a bunch of people she probably doesn't like? <laughs> yeah. uh, so first thing, um, in the EU, um, she doesn't run a campaign for commission, so she is uh, there because of member states. She's there because heads of states around the EU have decided that she'll be a really good commissioner. So she hasn't run a campaign, she didn't need money for campaign. Same thing for Vestager and the commission is Denmark that said, okay, that politician is really good to go for the EU. So Vestager was nominated by the Danish government, so she doesn't have to do run elections. The only ones that have to run elections would be the members of the European Parliament. And most of them, not all, get subsidies from their own national country, so they get money back for their campaign, so they don't fundraise. Um, why does she go? I've asked this a few times, I've never asked Ursula, I've asked this in, in to other commissioners that go. They say it's important to get the views from industry. And in a way, I think for them it's easier, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm not her, but if I think, and from what I've heard, again, I'm not quote me because I'm not her, but for her, it means that in one day, she gets all the views from all the digital companies in Europe. So she doesn't have to have a meeting with Atos, with Dassos, and then with Google or whatever. They've all been exposing. So she goes there one day, she gets all the views from industry, and, she, and that's it. Uh, there's obviously other things that I don't know, because I've never been. You have to pay to get in, and uh, even, even if I've paid, they probably wouldn't let me in. Um, you know, there might be political battles that it's important for her maybe to speak informally. You know, maybe she needs to speak informally to that guy, you know? And then so she thought, she felt, oh yeah, I've never managed to reach him and I'll get to meet him. Who knows, you know, who knows? But there's no rules against her coming for free and, and talking next to people that have paid to speak to her. Okay, um, it's not uh, just, uh, so Forum Europe does it for a lot of things. It does it for digital, for finance, for chemicals, for a lot of, yeah, environment, for a lot of different issues. Sometimes it's very specific ones. So Eurofi, for instance, 
They do events every six months, depending on the, on the presidency of the council. So this is, was Ljubljana, because this, uh, Slovenia had a former presidency, and they're going to have one in Paris in February. And here, um, they invite a lot of people that are really important. So those are the speakers, you have public authorities, you have ministers and stuff, huh? but you also have, you, like, here you have the European banking authority, but you also have companies, industry representatives, you also, also often you also have people from the US government also. And this happens um, usually in a very nice hotel during three days and they have speeches and conferences and then they have very nice dinners. And the reasons why I know this is because some of the MEPs that are invited, actually, sorry for saying this, but only the Germans. The Germans, <laughs> it's true, I'm sorry. Um, if you have a... Most of the time, if you have a German MEP that's invited, they will disclose all the money that they received and everything that was paid for. And then you can see everything that was paid for. And you really are first class hotel, first class uh, flight, first really interesting hotel, Carton or Hilton or whatever. All the dinners, all the receptions, everything paid. I'm not saying that because you're a member of the European Parliament and then you go to an event in Ljubljana for three months and you have three days and you're having a great time that you are going to you know, listen to everything Black Rocks is going to tell you after that. But what I'm saying is that it does have an impact on you. You're probably going to have a really positive image of Black Rock. And from a friend of mine that has been there, I haven't. He's been saying that a lot of it is really about informality. It's really about making friends and, you know, and they're nice people, they can help you later on if you need information and things like this. And I know most, it's, it's the public idea of this, you know, I lobby it's all about cocktails and dinners and receptions. It's not all about this, but a lot of it is around this. It's still something that, that it do and it has an impact. Otherwise, they wouldn't be spending so much money on, on doing it again and again. Um, you can also have this. Um, on a private basis, so this is a think tank. So I use a lot of website called Ask the EU, and with Ask the EU, I ask the European Commission for official documents. This is an official document, uh, sorry, uh, that I got, and this was, it's a bit old, but I really like it. In 2016, you had a commissioner that was invited by SEPS, a think tank, and in the invite, it was clearly said, um, Corporates members only, and there won't be anyone from the, the press. We do not allow for any press representative to be part of these meetings. So, if you're a member of SEPS, which all those companies are, being a member of SEPS, which is a think tank, actually gives you access to the commissioner on a private basis because there's no press, so she can speak freely. And sometimes the events are made by the institutions themselves. So, for the French presidency, in July, the, French the permanent representation of France in Brussels actually did an event with France Industrie and Take in France, which has now become uh, Numeum. And those two lobbies organized with the French presidency an event on the French presidency. So it's, sometimes it's also the institutions that help those lobbies making events. Okay, I'll, I've seen, you've seen a bit of think tanks, so I'm going to go through this really fast. I'm just going to show you Google because I think Google is a perfect example of what I, I was calling this, this bubble effect. Uh, ah, I get it in German, <laughs> um, Thank you for your computer. It might come up in English. Yep, okay. Uh, so that's the lobby register. So that's the website where companies can uh, enter any information they want. Um, so here you get all the information about Google, everything they work on. Here they tell you they have 21 person working for them. Those are those people that have a pass to the European Parliament. These are the fields of interest. And that's where it becomes interesting. This is all the associations that get money from Google. So Google gives money to Bruegel, really big think tank in Brussels. Business Europe biggest European uh, uh, trade uh, confederation, trade association. Again, what I was saying, it's Google giving money to Business Europe. It's called Business Europe, but it's not only about European businesses. You have a lot of think tanks. Uh, you have obviously so European Services Forum. It's about Services Policy Center. It's a think tank. 
Um, SEPS, it's a think tank, is the one that I showed you before, with like a private uh, breakfast with the commissioner. Uh, you also have uh, Euractive, important uh, newspaper at the EU level. You have Politico again, that's the main newspaper that everybody reads in the EU bubble. You have this think tank, and this think tank is the think tank of the European Right Party in the European Parliament. So all the members of parliament from the right-wing party, they have what they call the EPP, the European uh, People's Party. It's a European party of the right. And they have their own think tank, and they get money also from Google. Um, Friends of Europe, Marshall Found, this is also really uh, big think tanks. And European Youth Forum, European associations. They also give money to university. You see here, here Brussels Privacy Hub, Frey, Frey Universiteit Brussel, it's the Flemish University of Brussels. So here again, you really have this idea that I was trying to explain to you of the bubble, right? Really getting your message through, through different channels. Okay, and I like this picture because I think it, so it gives you the idea of this bubble, right? Where we all understand EU politics and all speak in all language. And then you have the European citizens that's probably lost in all this. Um, very technical and complex um, uh, language. That's the bit where I'm trying to be optimistic and positive and I don't want to left you dip too depressed. Um, rapporteurs are the people that are in charge of a file in the European Parliament. They now have to publish their meetings. Um, presidencies used to accept a lot of money from corporations. This time, France is only getting money from Renault and Stellantis, two car manufacturers. But in the past, Bulgaria had 40 sponsors, so we're improving. And in terms of transparency, the French permanent representation is now showing their list of meetings since July 2021. So here you see the the, what we call permanent representative is like the ambassador of France in the council. And France is now the um, president of the council. So here you have the list of who the uh, permanent representative is met with, and you have also his deputy. So this is already an improvement, right? The only problem is what I was saying, there's no sanctions. So if rules are not respected so far, nobody has gone, no lo EU lobbyist is in jail. Not that I want them to be in jail, but again, in Washington, when you don't respect the rules, you go to jail, which is not the case here. And this also is also explained by the structure of the EU. You don't have administrative EU law. So when, when, when a member of the European Parliament doesn't respect the law, he or she gets judged at the national level. Because there's no European law on uh, administrative and sanctions, right? So there's no way, there's not even a court where they can be sanctioned at the EU level. So, uh, you know, it's, 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 there's a lack of political will to get more transparent from the institution, but sometimes there's a lack of tools also, right? Um, there's more rules for MEPs, but they still are allowed to get side jobs. So here you have um, the number of members of the European Parliament that have other jobs. Um, so here, for instance, you have Verhofstadt is the worst one. <laughs> um, uh, he used to be the head of the Liberal group and he also used to be the Prime Minister of Belgium and he works, f he gets more money working for Sofina and um, another one that's going to come back, then to actually be, be a member of the European Parliament. But what I'm trying to show you here is that it is legal um, to get another job in the, um, in the EU Parliament. It's about, yeah, so if you see here the pie, it's about uh, one-fourth of the, of the members of the European Parliament get outside money from on top of what they already earn as a member of Parliament. And this is still legal. <coughs> And yeah, when, when I was telling you about sponsorship, about the French presidency, they only have two car makers. But when Germany was president of the council, they didn't get any sponsors. And there was an, an, um, a proposal to actually have rules and to make it illegal. But a lot of countries were against this, especially France. So there's not even rules about council sponsorship. There's only guidelines at the moment. And then to conclude, I'm showing you here how it's getting more and more transparent. But a real question would be, is transparency the solution? Do, by making it more transparent, do you make it more democratic? Um, 
To me, no, but it's open for discussion. To me, what really is missing is the idea of, there's two things that are missing to me. It's the idea of counter power. So I'm not saying that the NGO should have all the power in Brussels. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is at least you should have a debate with diverging views, and but you should have a counter power. That means when you are speaking about uh, fishes and uh, the fishery uh, policy in the EU, you should really have the voice of the small Portuguese fishermen and the environmental NGOs. And the small Portuguese fishermen, if he's not, if he doesn't earn enough to be in a big trade association, he's not represented in Brussels. And maybe there is a questionnaire that can fill in online, but it's in English and he probably doesn't know when, where and how to fill it in. I'm not saying he's stupid, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, Never ever on the Portuguese television at some point is going to listen to that there is a new fisheries policy in Europe and how it's going to affect him and who is going to lose and who is going to win. Because it's deep, most of the time it's depoliticized. It's technical. And by being technical, it's not political anymore. And to me, it's important for politics to be political, that we talk about losers, about winners, and about what do we do also with losers. Um, yeah, I think that's really what I wanted to ask. Also, how do you make EU issues sexy and political? And whose responsibility is it to do so? Because a lot of the time, I worked a lot on, uh, on trade issues, on uh, the transatlantic um, trade deal between the EU and the US. And a lot of what I was doing was actually explaining things and what it is. And the reasons why we got public attention is because we try to explain to people what it meant, this big trade agreement, in their daily lives, you know, in Belgium, in Portugal, in the UK, and in Germany. And we got into the debate because we did it well, but is it our responsibility to do it? Whose responsibility it is? Because those politicians get funded by public money, so shouldn't it be their responsibility to do it? And then, then there's a certain question also, is, and this is uh, since Brexit a lot, like uh, when you criticize the EU for being not transparent, a lot of the time you are being told you're anti-EU. There's a few debates where I was actually cancelled because EU decision makers wouldn't want to debate with me. I don't care. It's not about, about me. It's about the fact that there should be a debate. There should be a space where we criticize in order for it to improve. Sorry, I've been too long. Thank you. <laughs>
uh, members of these institutions need to um, disclose and talk about and make transparent uh, their meetings with uh, so with um, with uh, people from the civil society or uh, other organizations. Uh, but it's very important to say that these meetings are just bilateral meetings. So if there's an event going on, they don't have to talk about that. This is not a bilateral meeting according to these standards. And also members from the parliament and reporters were excluded from that uh, until recently, like just last end of last year, there was a uh, reform of this law that also reporters need to now disclose their meetings, but not events. Um, so there is a joint transparency register, as we have already heard this. Uh, not everyone has to re be registers, re registered to talk to uh, politicians and m members of the institutions. But some people do, and for more and more it's already now uh, ob an obligation to do that. But we can see that um, different groups are differently represented. So the uh, non-governmental organizations have the biggest share, but having a look at uh, companies uh, and groups and trade and business association if we take them together especially also with the uh, professional consultancies then we see a misrepresentation maybe already um, and this these are just the reported um, cases and you no know, people that are registering for this transparency just to make it um, official so um, before we go into the uh, case study where we want to like a little bit exemplify uh, the points that uh, Laura and others have uh, raised in this text of uh, under influence um, regarding the French presidency of the European Commission uh, or European Union uh, four main points there's privileged access for corporate lobbyists uh, we have revolving doors uh, think tanks as a rail of objectivity and doubled influence through na national governments and we will do that in a case study, uh, so picking one of the topics that are pending in the European Union for the next years, uh, the Europe uh, many of them extremely important for the future of our planet and this continent. Uh, so the European Green Deal, the d if Europe, Europe for the Digital Age, um, economy that works for people, um, also very important. Uh, I mean, it's just my personal opinion what's important, what's not. Of course, others can have different ideas about that, but we will now take the case of the uh, Europe fit for the digital age and have a look at how um, different um, lobbying groups and interests have come into this debate and try to shape it. Um, yeah, we, we have already seen like uh, Google and Facebook are on the top uh, 11 of all um, lobbying agents, uh, lobbying groups, uh, just as corp personal corporations, um, but their influence also extend to other groups like uh, think tanks and uh, consultancy agencies. But we already see that they are important, that they are spending a lot of money on that. And this uh, spending has increased over the years um, to probably over 18 million uh, euro uh, in total. And this is just the disclosed part. We can see that the digital topic is a quite important topic, so 20% of the recorded commission meetings uh, are about um, digital issues. Um, already said again, these are only the disclosed ones. Um, we have a thing of revolving doors, though. Uh, one example is uh, Aura Sala um, worked for um, the in-house think tank of the European Union, was there uh, uh, has had a lot to do with uh, civil society and how this um, about disinformation, electoral influences of uh, certain in institutions. Um, and she's one of five people working for uh, Facebook, like on the official side. Three of them were working in, in EU institutions before. So that's a big part of that. We have already heard about uh, or the about the different think tanks, one of them which is also uh, financed by uh, Google as we have seen a Center for Data Innovation and they are organizing these different meetings um, with a uh, person from, from the parliament and uh, so there, there is this, these things happening, some of them are um, just publishing different text in media and trying to uh, influence the opinion as we see uh, a very badly written article about GAFA and tax and how 
uh, this how it, how, it, how, it, how a study from the civil society was wrong in many respects based on weird arguments, but they are um, trying to influence the public and there's uh, a lot of money going on. And um, the fourth point, lobbying and national governments. So this is um, an excerpt from the website of the Austrian presidency. There are two digital companies, A1, who's, uh, who are um, building networks um, uh, and infrastructure and Microsoft were sponsoring the EU presidency of Austria, so they gave the infrastructure to the Austrian uh, groups to organize their work and in that way uh, really um, included, like made them part of their environment. Uh, for the visual learners and uh, tip, uh, I think this is a very interesting series. I really enjoyed it. Parliament, it's very fun in German, English and French, I think. Uh, advice to watch it. So what should we do? What needs to be done? We need better data probably. Uh, we need to make think tanks transparent. We need to cool down periods for people working in the parliament or in, in politics. Um, not to do, do have this revolving doors. We need to equalize participation through duties, redistribution of funds uh, and strong institutions that uh, the EU institution doesn't rely too much on uh, external advisors. Uh, we should ban private sponsorship from governments and we need to raise our voice and organize in order to make a counter argument there. And this is where I go over to Caroline. So, uh, is there hope? Um, I don't know, but we will talk about uh, citizen lobbying. So, uh, let's see how if we, we have something uh, to get out on this. Um, what sits in lobbying? Well, um, first you define from the differences. Um, you have activism, that is a big umbrella of a lot of things that you have, you can do as a citizen to change the system. And then you have citizen lobbying that um, is kind of different because you're using uh, the system. So you're trying to change within the system. You have the methods that lobbyists use and you uh, talk with these beautiful people that are public authorities and public servants and you can organize and try to make a uh, change within the system or using the institutions, uh, traditional institutions that uh, govern the system as it is. Uh, how to do it? Um, I use a, a reference uh, that uh, Professor Lora um, organized um, about uh, Alberto Alemano. He wrote a book about citizen lobbying. He first says that you have to pick your battle. Climate change is too big. You have to change something that is feasible, for example, to implement a carbon tax. You have to do your research because you have to convince other people that you what you are talking uh, is not something that you don't understand about. You have to map your environment and then in, in, in the sense it mirrors how um, in a way traditional lobbying uh, works. You have to understand who are their targets, uh, who are your allies and of course who are your or opponents. The lobbying plan, so how you, will you work? Will you change um, inside lobbying in, in a situation that you meet with public authorities? But also outside lobbying is also uh, influencing media and the public about uh, uh, your battle. Uh, and of course, money, uh, sometimes you, you need it. And also, if you, if you want, you can have also two if you need it to monitor the progress if your policymaker is uh, working with you. But, um, well, this is kind of very interesting and very cool, but is it possible really? Because when you look into the reality, uh, these lobbying systems, they have a lot of money. Only in the US, they have 3.5 billion in budget uh, is spent uh, yearly with uh, just lobbying. And the EU is almost two billion, so it's a lot of money. They have this a lot of skilled people working on this. Uh, they have privileged access to the government. They meet uh, a lot of people on, on his co professional careers. And therefore, having money, having people, you have power. You have uh, privileged access to uh, policymakers. 
So um, I want to just remember something uh, that happens in the COP26. A lot of activists from the Global South were excluded because they couldn't come to the COP26. Uh, it's not um, a specific case of uh, citizen lobbying or uh, specific, but highlights the difficulties that people from minorities, people from the Global South and uh, regular people have to access public authorities and really convince them. Even high profile activists are having a hard time to reach you to, to make some change in the world. So it's kind of hard to think um, about hope on this situation. So I bring another, uh, uh, we bring another concept, uh, the four roles of activism. Uh, and there I I it says that uh, there is the reformer, the rebel, the citizen, and the change agent. We understand that the citizen lobbying is more in the role of the reformer, someone that is working within the system to change it. But sometimes you are believing too much on the institutions, and institutions sometimes don't deliver. You have the role of the citizen, someone, for example, we can think about climate change, someone uh, reducing its carbon emissions, using a bike okay cool but individually it doesn't impact so much on the system you have the rebel your regular epoch student wants to tackle and destroy capitalism cool that's nice but sometimes it's not very practical and you also have the change agent someone that is educating people convincing but it can be a kind of utopian so yeah um, before ending this presentation we want to think that citizen lobbying is part of the toolkit that um, people, uh, regular people can have in order to change the system. And sometimes it's not enough. Uh, we say that's not enough because for problems like climate change, digital monopolies, you have to have much more tools and much more people working on the same objectives. Um, and you go to the questions, of course. Uh, do you want to read yours or? Yeah. Maybe, um, so my question would be winning the battle. In your opinion, do we really have a chance as citizen, uh, citizen, um, citizens to compete with corporate lobbying? So your personal assessment of this kind of situation? And I want to know about the elections. Uh, in which way presidential election uh, year in France will change how uh, the dynamic in the EU Council affects uh, how interests are captured by corporations. That's it, that's it and thank you for your attention and, well, thank you. Laura, do you have comments on, uh, yeah. <laughs> on this uh, very interesting point of view? <laughs> Maybe uh, it's a bit of utopia, but... Uh, uh, I have a fire phone. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, sorry. <laughs> okay. I want to give you two mics. Um, okay, I'm an eternal optimist, so I'm going to say yes to this question, but um, it's also from my own perspective, so... You always speak from also where you stand, and when I started working on lobbying in Brussels, I started to work, as I was saying, on a trade agreement. It was called TTIP, and uh, so it's a US-EU trade agreement. And I remember when I started, um, nobody really cared, no one knew what I was talking about. And four years after, it was a big thing, and I went on TV, and my mum was proud, and it was great. Uh, but it's not about me and my ego, it's mostly how what I was trying to show is that um, there are moments where EU issues become politicized. And that, at that time it was trade, later on it was glyphosate. Uh, so four years ago, glyphosate was to be renewed, like really in the dark room for 15 years, and it was not gonna be an issue, right? The ministers were gonna come, say yes, end of the story. That's not how it happened. There was a lot of mobilization, a lot of uh, signatures. It ended up being super political. It was only renewed for five years and not all the countries said yes. Some abstained because there was too many uh, differences be between ministers. Obviously, we didn't win in the sense that it was not banned. But then some countries banned it. Austria banned glyphosate a year after and it's still banned in Austria. So, yes, I think you, we can compete, but I think the only time you really compete is when you really create this counter power. And I think this counter power is also not available to everyone and it quite, it's costly in terms of times and resources. So you can't, 
Like you can't fight all the battles at the same time, unlike what the corporations do. There are also timings when you have more space to m for to compete. So b before elections, before um, electoral um, MEP elections, you have more space than um, than at other times. But it is really difficult. But again. As you were saying before, I have the same views as you have on citizen lobbying, so I'm, I'm glad that you had the same critical point of view, but um, I don't think it only is the responsibility of citizens to actually compete with this corporate uh, influence. It's also the responsibility of decision makers to actually f do something about it, the rules, but also talk about it publicly, and, make sh and there's all these things about expertise also. So, for instance, the, the Commission uh, gets a lot of uh, companies to do uh, some expertise for them and the Parliament has now decided to have its own think tank and the Parliament is asking more and more universities to do studies. So the Parliament has decided to create its own expertise. It could be better, there could be more budget, it could also be counter expertise, you know, maybe sometimes things like trade, environment or science, maybe sometimes or political economy, you know, this, maybe there should be two or three universities doing the studies just to show that there are different views and to create a debate. So it's not ideal what the parliament is doing, but it has understood that there's an expertise problem and you can't only rely on corporations for your knowledge. So it's a first step. So I think we can compete, but I think we're not the only one responsible. And, and at the EU level, it's even more difficult because it's, it seems so far away for people. It seems so, so distant. The French presidency. <laughs> um, so the election. So Macron is Macron is very clever, and Macron knows that one of his main opponents is going to be the extreme right. So one of the main difference between him and the extreme right was going to make him popular. It's Europe. So Macron is talking a lot about Europe because that's how he's going to be shown as different from uh, Zemmour and, uh, and Marine Le Pen. So Europe has become. It's part of his way of promoting himself, right? And he knows that, that his electorate is very pro-European. The problem is, is that because we're on a campaign, the European issues tend to be, um, they communicate upon, but they're not always discussed. So what I'm saying is that there's lots of communication about social Europe, about how we're going to improve platform workers, platform workers, so the people working for Deliveroo, Uber and all, and all those things. They're also talking about minimum wage in Europe. They're talking about equal pay between men and, and women. And that's how they spin it and say, oh, look how France is great at the council. They also try to put on hold certain trade agreements, like trade agreement between Mercosur in South um, America and, and Europe. And during the French presidency, this is on hold. That's the communication. And then you have the reality. The trade agreement is on hold until the elections, right? <laughs> it'll, get, it'll get through in April, right? This, this we know. Same thing with all the trade agreements that are on hold at Chile and Mexico, on hold until March, it'll go through in April. And second thing, uh, minimum wage is not going to go through because we know that most Nordic countries don't want it. Platform workers, we know that Macron has a very distinct idea. It's all about social uh, dialogue but with self-employed people. So he wants to create a social dialogue with self-employed work. So not salaries, not employees. He doesn't want the, the people working on their bikes to be salaries and to have labor rights. He wants them to keep being self-employed, but to have a social dialogue. So there's a lot of you know, talking and spinning, but behind the reality is not so nice. And to me, this is really problematic because by communicating about how great Macron is doing things at the European level, when at the end we know that he's not doing that much, it's actually fueling even more Euroscepticism. And that's really an issue. And it's also using Brussels again. When I say using Brussels is because the council is such a black box. Basically, uh, imagine today we're in the council, right? And we are the different uh, member states and we're discussing platform workers, for instance. Um, Sweden wants them to be employees, to have a lot of labor rights. Spain wants them to be, to have, yes, yeah, strong labor rights. France doesn't and Germany doesn't have an opinion. At the end of the meeting, we're all going to go out and do a press conference and say, we've had a compromise and we've decided this. We, 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 never ever will anyone know what Spain said, what uh, Sweden said or what France said, ever. So Macron can go back to Paris and say, I tried, Ooh, I tried so much for labor rights, but uh, you know, Brussels. No, that's not fair. 
because that's not true. And so you're using Brussels again as an excuse for your unpopular policies that you have decided, but Brussels in an easy way out.